my wonderful friends, Jeffrey Holland, a personal friend, many of these stake presidencies have been friends over many years. To you and to you wonderful students, I come before you very humbly tonight. I have thought about this assignment for some few weeks, and I sincerely pray for your and interest in your prayers tonight. When I was at BYU, they didn't have this facility, and in the old basketball games that I used to be a cheerleader at, we played them over in the Springville gym in Springville, Utah. That was before the field house even was built. And, uh, and it, was a great, it was a great day when we were able to leave the uh, Springville High School Gymnasium and come here. I have loved being in Provo most of my life. I have loved growing up in Happy Valley. I, I remember a missionary who came from the East and was in our mission field, and all the course of his mission he talked about not coming to BYU, how he wouldn't come here where he would need to be regimented. And I remember this good elder, Elder Hinckley. who went back to Dartmouth on a basketball scholarship. And after he had been there just a few, few weeks, he called me in Brussels, where we were still serving. And he said, President, do you think you could help get me into BYU? He was tired of smoke-filled rooms and all of the innuendos that go on in some of the universities of the world, having returned from a mission. He came here and, as is often the case, found someone to take to the temple, completed his education, and has thanked me profusely many times since then. Tonight, I would first like to tell you a little story about Legrand Richards. And I choose him as my subject because he represents the qualities that I want to talk about tonight. Brother Richards was at a conference about a year ago when he was in his 95th year. And going to a conference in which he reorganized a stake, he sat on the stand and the choir sang a beautiful rendition. And he thought they were so outstanding that he turned around to the choir leader and said, I'll bet you, you could sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic if I asked you, couldn't you? And the choir leader nodded and said, yes, I think we could. Good, he said, I'd like to have it sung at the end of this, at the end of this conference today. In and of itself, that doesn't seem like a, a very unusual thing. But unbeknownst to Brother Richards, sitting halfway back in the audience, was a man who had been inactive and decided that he would go to conference. And if the choir sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic, he would know that that would be a signal from heaven that he was supposed to be active again. <laughs> a most strange series of events, except that isn't where it ends. Because he was there and he made the decision to become active again, they reorganized his ward bishopric the week later. And he was called into the office to be a counselor in that bishopric. And he already had, of course, his answer. He knew what he would need to do. And then he recounted the story, this spiritual little story out of one of the 100,000 pages of Latter-day Saints throughout the world where the Spirit of Father in Heaven guides us. Now, 
I'd like to talk to you tonight about the subject of becoming as a little child, because I'm concerned for a number of reasons. First, there is a very subtle attempt in the world to no longer want children. In the world in general, the model is no longer a family, but rather two young people, both working, who are enlarged by a good income now with two incomes, and they can afford a lifestyle that only in the past the rich could enjoy. Sometimes this couple, in their finely tailored suits or on the beaches of the world with their lean, tanned bodies, never want to be encumbered even by one child. Children interfere with their carefree lifestyle. For many, child-rearing may be one of the greatest casualties of modern times. In these cases, they place their own pursuits, their own interests first. There is no time for children. This, of course, is not the case or the norm for Latter-day Saints, but it is rampant in the world and denies not only the bodies for spiritual children of our Father in Heaven, but also denies these people some of the learning and inspiration of a loving Father in Heaven essential to exaltation. Secondly, the purpose of marriage is to provide bodies for the spirit children of our Father in Heaven, and also to help us learn how to love, sacrifice, obey, and serve one another. There are thousands of learning experiences in the family, each contributing to the other. It is the greatest learning factory in this world to overcome selfishness, and it is designed by our Father in Heaven to be of an eternal nature and importance. Children have not lost their place in God's society, but are essential to it, and the lessons we learn from them are absolutely imperative. Some of these lessons, gifts, qualities, I'd like to talk to you about tonight. One of the greatest needs we have, my young friends, is to retain and develop the innate qualities of little children, for they are alive in Christ. As students of this great university, we learn many things that will bless our lives provide us with professional opportunities and many new spiritual insights. But let us not forget some innate qualities that will permit us a fullness and a quality of life and eventually lead to eternal life. Not too long ago, I came across this little poem that will introduce what I'd like to say about little children. My dad gave me a dollar bill, cause I'm his smartest son. And I swapped it for two shiny quarters, cause two's better than one. <laughs> and then I took the quarters and traded them to Lou for three shiny dimes. I guess he don't know that three is more than two. Just then came along old blind Bates, and just cause he can't see, he gave me four nickels for my three dimes and four is more than three. And I took the nickels to Hiram Coombs down at the old feed store, and the fool gave me five pennies for them, and five is more than four. And then I went and showed my dad, and he got all red in the cheeks and closed his eyes and shook his head, too proud of me to speak. <laughs> <clears throat> it is obvious from this little story that children don't know everything. But my young friends, there are many things that they know instinctively that are great gifts, and if not understood and pursued energetically, can limit the power, the beauty, the quality, and destiny 
of our lives. Isn't it interesting that the Savior would make the following statement? And again I say unto you, ye must become as a little child, or ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Over the years I have learned some things from children that I would like to share with you today, which to my mind helped me to realize why the Savior said what he did. First of all, they are endowed with a great power to believe. They believe they can do anything. Dad can do anything. The Lord can do anything. My youngest son a few years ago went out each day believing that he could catch a hundred, maybe a thousand butterflies and was prepared with enough bottles to prove it. You su suggest something and they believe it can happen. Frankly, the thought never occurs, enters their mind that it couldn't be done. That power to believe is sorely needed in the world today by everyone, every father, mother, member, bishop, missionary. If we are to catch the vision of the Lord and the prophet as he continually encourages us to higher ground. A few years ago, I quite miraculously attended a conference in western Washington. I had secretly prayed I could be assigned there. At, on, on week's end, but one of the twelve was assigned. And then the member of the twelve's assignment was changed a few days before the conference, and my assignment was changed from another stake to this particular one. When I arrived and had an interview with the stake president, I knew we needed to do something to carry out the mandate on missionary work, for it was not working in the stake. We all worked diligently for, together for about two days in this conference making some suggestions to improve the involvement of members in the work. In the concluding session, I did something I have, never, I have never done before in a conference. I blessed the people that if they would follow the suggestions given, believing without doubting that a special blessing from the Lord would come upon them as a stake and many would join the church. Incidentally, the stake president and I felt that members should immediately make a list of our close circle of friends, as President Kimball had counseled us to do. You remember he said that the Lord has placed some of those people in our circle because we are supposed to bring them into the church. And so this 34-year-old stake president who had been in the church eight years led out, and because of his childlike faith, belief in God and his servants, he commenced immediately. By the middle of next week, he telephoned to report that he and his wife and small children had prepared a list of 200 names that they felt would be receptive to the gospel. One week later, he wrote this following letter in quotes. We are hearing stories daily of missionary experiences. I've made approximately two contacts and have my next-door neighbors playing on the ward basketball team, and we've had them over for family home evening. Also, I believe we have another lady acquaintance ready to hear the missionaries. Our children have been taking friends to primary, and Julie is working on a widow to get her to Relief Society. Oh, I almost forgot. We held a special meeting for the brethren and their spouses and the Relief Society presidencies and their spouses to discuss and motivate them about missionary work. We challenged them to come to the meeting, as you did me, with names of non-member families they were going to work with and more than 1,000 names were brought to that meeting. The blessing that fell upon our stake has yielded the spirit and the faith and the action that we all can feel. He continues in his letter, one of the elders corn presidents went home from the meeting pondering how to approach his neighbor he didn't even know. The next day the president was working in his backyard when the neighbor came over and asked, Brian, when is your family going to start sharing us the gospel with us? Start fellowshipping us? This, of course, surprised the quorum president very much. <laughs> but after a long talk with the neighbor, he discovered that this man had been raised in southern Idaho, 
around the LDS people and had great respect for them. We are convinced, he reports in his letter, that the blessing which was pronounced upon our stake prompted, prompted this man to come forward and express his desires. The Lord really has blessed us because we believed. Another example. In a ward in Salt Lake City, where we live, a few years ago, a bishop made a resolute, absolute commitment to himself that he was going to try and have every young person go on a mission. And so he began the painstaking efforts that that would take, the hundreds of interviews, the luncheons, the, the malt shops, the many, many contacts that that would make. And two years later, in our ward, this young man had 30 full-time missionaries serving at the same time. Many had come from inactive families. Among them was a couple that had been excommunicated a couple years earlier. They repented, changed their lives, went on a mission along with a formerly inactive son. Let me tell you about another young man. I apologize that I do not have his name. While I was in Europe, I picked up one day the Stars and Stripes uh, newspaper of the LDS servicemen, of the uh, servicemen. It recounted the story of a young man who made his decision to clear a two-meter bar in the high jump. That's about the height of uh, Devon Durant, just about right on height. And so he laid out the track, put up those rickety old bars with nails sticking out them instead of holes drilled in them, and then bought his bamboo bar and set that up. And painstakingly he tried a thousand times, two thousand times, until one day he cleared the two-meter mark to be his forever. As long as he would ever live, he was immortalized in his own mind. And I was really caught up short when I read the last bottom line which said that he only had one leg. Yes, belief without doubting, like the prophet Joseph Smith had when he was 14, this is mandatory. See how uncomplicated it is to just believe to believe on his words, the Savior said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Another thing I've learned from children is this. They have implicit faith in the principles of the gospel in parents, leaders, in people in general. When they are young and pure, they don't have all the answers. They have faith that mom and dad are right, and they would never lead them astray. What a heavy burden that is upon us, each one of us, as we take upon these charges to build our faith that it will not destroy others, a faith to do what is right when it is required. I think of the simple little story told of President David O. McKay, the ninth president of the church, when he was a very young lad. He was taught by his father to pray when he was ever confronted with a problem. And when he was eight years old, he received a new pocket knife from his dad for his birthday. And he recounts the experience that day of getting on his horse and riding out into the valley, picking up a few sticks of wood and and shaving off those shavings and starting a fire, eating his lunch, and then returning home. He said he began riding home, and he remembered that he had forgotten his new pocket knife. And so he quickly turned his horse around and raced back to the same spot and searched in vain for that knife. He then remembered his father's teaching, and because of the counsel of his father and his faith in him, he got on his knees and he talked simply and earnestly to the Lord. 
In the midst of the prayer, he saw a vision come into his mind, a picture as clear as any TV picture. And there, in that picture, he saw the knife under a clump of weeds. He got up on his feet, he looked around, and walked directly to the scene he had just witnessed in his mind and found his knife exactly as it had been revealed. What a powerful lesson of faith in one's Father and the Lord this young president-to-be learned that day. This kind of faith leads to spiritual and other accomplishments. Can you see that because of this, faith children and young people are humble and teachable and as such become benefactors of truth and happiness? One of the greatest armies for the world to witness today is that great army of 26,000 young missionaries who serve in this, on this earth with faith in God and His principles and in their leaders. Faith. Another lesson taught me over and over again is that children are intrinsically obedient. As children develop, they obey without a thousand reasons. For example, it is fun and right for them to pay their tithes. If I could tell you all the stories I had as a bishop about people and the difficulty they had in paying tithes, if I could share with you the book of stories that I know personally. I noticed the other day a little girl with a tithing envelope in her hand looking all through the chapel trying to find the bishop to pay her tithes. How powerfully this lesson was taught once in France when a family got in their car to go to see the grandparents. And while en route, they saw the grandmother coming in the other direction and pulled the car over to stop to get her attention. As soon as this car stopped, a small boy in the back seat jumped out of the door and began to run across a busy highway to see his grandmother. The father, seeing his son in danger, just yelled, Stop! as the boy reached the center of the road. There was no time to give instructions or reasons, just direction. The boy, hearing his father's voice, stopped and froze until he was rescued. How profound it is to be like a little child and to be obedient. One of the most classic of all the stories in the scriptures of a simple and complete obedience without having reasons is that of Abraham and Isaac. Listen to this great experience. And it came to pass in these, after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of my mountains, which I will tell thee. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, you abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come back to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went of them together. And Isaac spake unto his Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So they went, both of them together, excuse me, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac 
and laid him upon the altar, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And an angel of the Lord called out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For I n- now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. How many times we might have had greater blessings if we had been totally and immediately obedient as what Abraham on this most difficult occasion. A child teaches us over and over this principle, and only because he is led in his heart to do it. There are no reasons, no lengthy dialogue or explanations, just simple obedience. All the blessings that wait those who are obedient now and forever. Yes, students, to become learned is good if you do not forget wisdom and obedience to higher laws which come from heaven, as the scriptures say. To become learned is good if they hearken under the counsel of the Lord. Another thing I've learned is that children love with a perfect love, which has no bounds. With little children, there is no judgment or second-guessing or holding back. These qualities are innate. I noticed some time ago that a young son and his friend had somehow had bad words, and they were really angry. But the real lesson came just minutes later when all the offenses and the discord were forgotten, never never to be remembered again. They just followed an instinctive pattern that sometimes when we're older and wiser and more mature, we fail to remember. The world so needs the love and concern of others like that of children, whose love springs forth naturally and completely. I spent a few minutes a few weeks ago in a little French town called Pont-à-Mousson, organizing a new stake in that area. And there was a little French girl there, a small daughter of one of the leaders. She was a pure, beautiful young child who had total trust and love and confidence in everyone around her, including me. There were no inhibitions to her warmth her faith in others, and a desire to let us feel her love for the Lord, for her parents, the members, her leaders, me, a total stranger. She was so delightful, I wanted to bring her home. They love with an almost perfect love, and if we can capture that in our lives forever, how blessed we would be and how enriched the world could become. Another point I've learned from little children. They serve anxiously. Before little children get on to our ways, they serve because they are asked, because they want to. They gratefully look around them and see a little bird in distress and pick it up, bandage its wounds, overfeed it, all out of something bestowed in them by a loving Heavenly Father. This service is never prompted by gain nor personal gratification, but rather grows out of a love not qualified by earthly experience or time, but limitless, like purity and charity. It is possible that so priceless are these qualities that our Father in Heaven has put a restraining order, if you will, upon Satan, that he shall not have power to tempt or to change them. The scriptures say, But behold, I say unto you, 
that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. Wherefore, they cannot sin. For power is not given to Satan to tempt little children until they begin to become accountable before me. Can we learn the power of this? To serve anxiously, with full intent and full heart? What power and beauty this brings to our lives. Think of the manifold opportunities around you, in and out of the Church, to serve our fellow men, not for the reward or the accolades of people, but because needs are seen, and quietly and anxiously one seeks, as a little child, to fulfill those needs. Listen, listen to the Savior's classic story of serving others. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the, shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him the same way. And again he responds, Inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. The righteous will go unto life eternal. Think about that service anxiously for a moment. Walking upon the earth today, there are probably, this is only a guess, there are probably one quarter of a million, over 250,000 returned missionaries living upon this earth. Think of what might happen if one quarter of a million missionaries were to continue serve, to serve with full heart, full intent, full capacity. President Kimball's dreams and those of others who preceded him would surely come to pass. Think of the missionary who returns home, having felt that he has completed his mission and hangs up his boxing gloves, so to speak. Some countries, that may be literal. <laughs> but he has really just begun to serve, to bring people into the kingdom of God. Last summer, I had a delightful experience with a returned missionary from our mission who baptized two people in a 30-month mission in France. But he had now finished medical school and came to see me 
and said, my mission only began in France. Since I've returned home and gone through medical school, it has been my privilege to bring four medical doctors into the church and their families, one every year that I was in school. Finally, may I mention just one other dimension which has illuminated my life many times. Little children have a zest for life. An anxiousness to live it to the fullest, like the Grand Richards. You know, the Grand Richards, when just before his death, somebody reported that he received a letter about the death of his brother. And instead of mourning, he said, good for him. <laughs> good for him. Just like that. He had lived worthy. He was old. There were people on the other side waiting. And he had, had every right to expect the fullness of eternal life. And I can tell you from the many discussions I had with Elder Richards that he looked forward to that day and felt that each time one of the general authorities died that he got cheated. <laughs> he hung on tenaciously, as we know, and lived to be older than any other general authority in this dispensation. But he was ready to go. He had a zest to go and to begin his work there as soon as the Lord decided. They have an anxiousness to live life to its fullest, an enthusiasm to get up and get going, to do things. Yes, they are almost perpetual motion, but, but in this we can learn valuable lessons. They seek new experiences. They have no pretense or scorn or condescension or pride. They are natural and warm and outgoing. They are excited about the smallest things and as such captivate our attention. They experience each day with newness, not building upon the difficulties of the previous day. They don't even remember them. They teach us that spontaneity and excitement for life are really essential to happiness and self-fulfillment and really come from a loving God. Yes, they are the stick that keeps things stirred up. They are anxiously engaged and enthused there is a total extension of themselves into every dimension of their lives. Each day is a wonderful new expanding experience, unencumbered by the previous day's issues or problems. Those troubles are forgotten, and new opportunities and joy and living are again theirs. The vitality of their lives in these things is a wonder to behold. If we can retain this great power, how blessed will it be the days of our lives and for the, all those who surround us. Little children are not a trial to our faith or love. They are not instinctively grouchy or self-righteous or hateful. These are acquired traits. Some of the greatest lessons we'll ever need are to hang on to and cultivate these gifts given by a loving Father in heaven. Remember, no Latter-day Saint should ever be a trial to another Latter-day Saint, but a blessing of joy and knowledge and faith and service and great appreciation for all the blessings of life. There are so many. My years as bishop taught me that the words of Mormon are absolutely true, and I bear my solemn testimony to you that they are. In the 100 or more interviews held with eight-year-olds before being baptized into the kingdom, I know these things are true. Moroni reports and records these words. Little children are alive in Christ, even from the foundation of the world. Little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. 
Teach parents that they must repent and be baptized and humble themselves as their little children, and they shall be saved with their little children. And finally, all children are alike unto me, wherefore I, the Lord, love little children with a perfect love, and they are all alike and partakers of salvation. Let us, in all of our wisdom getting, in all of the vicissitudes of life, in all of the experiences that we're going to go through, and they are innumerable, but let us this day become as a little child in these important dimensions. May we this day and always remember the words of the Savior and retain and develop the powers given to us very early in our earthly lives, the power of believing, the power of faith, the power of obedience, the power of service, the power of near-perfect love, and finally, the great power of boundless enthusiasm for the really true things of our Father in heaven. Add to these the intelligence and knowledge we can gain through our personal effort at this university and after, and add to that the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then our lives will be full and boundless and infinitely more useful and more enriched. I bear my testimony. I know these sound like simple little things tonight, but they are the substance of life as we grow older and where happiness is found in a home, in a ward, in a companionship. These things are also found. They are they are empowered and blessed from on high, and they are never forgotten, no matter what degree or station we achieve. May God bless us to hold fast and to develop them. I humbly pray and leave my personal witness that these things are true in the name of Jesus Christ.